Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Rising fuel prices are on the political and economic agenda following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss whether South Africa has any options to limit the shock on consumers. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. There are some serious concerns about the impact of rising fuel prices on domestic inflation. That's right. You know, we've already had the National Treasury revise the inflation outlook to between 5 and 5.5%. Five and so we have an inflation band of 3 to 6%, so it's still within that. But it's, it's a lot higher than what in February budget, I think the inflation uh, expectation was closer to 4.8%. So we can already see following the invasion by Russia of Ukraine, uh, oil prices have been very volatile since then. They've even gone as high as close to $140 a barrel. They, they've since come down. The currency markets have also reacted quite violently. So there's a concern that there's going to be these spillover effects into domestic inflation. And uh, it's a real concern, not only on fuel, but also on food. Together, Russia and Ukraine make up something like 30% uh, of global wheat exports, and certain countries in Africa are highly dependent on that wheat. So there's definite uh, uh, inflation concerns all over the world, but also in South Africa. And the longer this conflict goes on, the more these uh, concerns will start translating uh, into higher inflation. What options is South Africa considering to limit the impacts? I think the, the, on the fuel side, the, the National Treasury and the DMRE are looking to review uh, the basic fuel price formula. So they're running the numbers there. They're also looking at the regulatory components of that, uh, which is a major component, about a third or over a third of our uh, pump price is now uh, taxes and levies. So th that would be a major lever or instrument to look at, the regulated component. Uh, Treasury put some numbers to that, but around a, a rand, uh, both in terms of re reformulating the, the formula, um, as well as the re uh, dealing with some of the regulatory components, could be taken off. But that, that in a context where we're looking at a possible two rand a litre increase from in April, after really steeply high rising uh, uh, prices during the year. We know that in inland, we're paying more than uh, 21 rand a litre. This is a very, very big worry for government, but for, for ordinary consumers that are seeing lots of other items already going up. So the, the electricity is set to go up, as we know, um, April 1, obviously, as uh, municipal consumers, we'll see that in July when the municipal adjustments are made, but businesses will see it or direct ESCOM customers will see it immediately in April. We've got these fuel price increases really rising steeply. We're seeing meat, sugar, <laughs> vegetables, everything uh, is rising. So it's a, it's a real, real concern. There are also security of supply concerns, especially for diesel amid high consumption by ESCOM and theft. Yes, as we saw with uh, Eskom uh, during this recent load shedding bout, they had to use a lot of diesel, uh, 9 million litres a day at one stage. The outlook for the year is for high diesel consumption for the OCGT plants because the coal fleet remains unreliable and uh, Kuburg's one unit is off and there was an incident this week that nearly led to two Kuburg units being off that was uh, in the media. So we've got this 900 megawatts not available from Kuburg and for the whole year, once unit two comes back on, unit one will go off for this extended maintenance. So uh, there's a lot of diesel that uh, Eskom is going to be burning. They were talking about a capacity factor of 7%. Uh, regulators granted them in the tariff only a 3% capacity factor, but I think uh, generally Eskom is on the side of rather burning diesel rather than higher in more intense load shedding, so there's going to be a lot of diesel consumption. And there are security of supply concerns there. Um, there's also security of supply concerns for motorists because the high levels of theft, they have come down this year, but there's still high levels of theft on the Transnet pipeline. And this is leading to spillages. This is leading to obviously loss of supply, but the spillages are particularly worrying because you know, these are environmental compliance issues uh, that pipeline has to meet its environmental license to operate. And uh, both the spills and the treatment of those spills, the remediation of those sites, there's a lot of questions about 
uh, where the transnet is fully on top of that. So that is also a worry. If that pipeline were to be shut for compliance issues, we would be forced to bring fuel up uh, from the coast via tankers, road and rail. And I don't know if we really have that sort of capacity, but that fuel pipeline has to be kept open and has to be remain compliant. So there's serious, both on the Eskom, huge amounts of consumption and the transnet uh, theft issues. There's, there's real worries about that. This comes at a time when big decisions also need to be made about the local refining fleet. Yes, you know, I saw uh, this week the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy made it clear that they want a domestic refining capacity for security of supply reasons. But all the international oil majors, as we know, are not really interested in sustaining their capacity here. Uh, we've already had the engine announcement that they're going to be converting to an import terminal. SAPREF has said they're going to be tapering and closing by the end of this month and as o are open to selling the SAPREF refinery. We've got um, Glencore saying they will restart the Astron refinery, but that's been closed for, for a long period now. So we don't really have a strong domestic refining fleet. We've still got Sassel, obviously, producing fuel from coal, and we've got the Natref refinery, which is Total and, and Sassel. But this is an issue that's been knocking around for many years. And in the energy transition, it is highly risky <laughs> to be investing in new refining capacity, especially because there's a glut of refining capacity. So to see this as a security of supply and a way of lowering the cost of petrol solution, I think is uh, unfounded or is misplaced or misguided. Um, I think we need to, to have a proper discussion with the international oil majors. Is it really in our interest to have a state-owned company buying these, these companies, uh, then having to recapitalize them with uh, no, so, and there's no sign of a, of a cost recovery mechanism because they can't produce the fuel at the quality that's required by the new vehicle fleet. So it's, there's a lot of problems uh, and a lot of issues to resolve and to be thinking about a state-owned company buying or a state-owned company building a refinery in this very major transition, energy transition, seems to be very, very risky. Over the medium term, what does South Africa need to do to reduce its exposure to fuel price shocks? Well, you know, the, the Europeans are having to do this at an accelerated pace because they want to wean themselves off Russian gas at the moment. But we have to, you know, really look at what our advantages are. And the, the best way to, you know, eliminate geopolitical risk and uh, re reduce our fuel imports overall is to really accelerate our renewables rollout at a much higher pace that's, than is catered for in the integrated resource plan and, and also should be seen as a spillover into other energy services, things like mobility, so electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles for trains and for long haul, uh, long -haul trucks, for instance, for shipping. We really need to be accelerating uh, as fast as possible, this rollout of renewable, of wind and solar, variable renewable. So that's also always slapped down as it's not base load. But what will happen is when you overbuild, not just for the electricity system, there will be this e extra electrons available for electric vehicle charging in the middle of the day, for instance. There will be electrons available to uh, split water into oxygen and hydrogen to produce green hydrogen, which can have a range of derivatives. So that really should be 100% the focus of our energy plan instead of fiddling around the edges. Obviously, we have so, some immediate crises and we have to fill those, but we have an opportunity as a sun and wind potent country to really transition and that should be 100% the focus uh, of our energy policy makers not trying to extend coal, not to talk about clean coal. Yes, we do have domestic coal resources. Not to be talking about massive reliance on gas, which is going to just add another balance of payment risk because it's going to have to be imported for a long time. And not to be talking about nuclear, which is going to be highly expensive, which is going to raise affordability concerns. So we do have possible blueprint out that lowers the geopolitical risks, lowers our carbon emissions, and improve security of supply, not just in electricity services, the current electricity service, but in future electricity services. 
around electric vehicles and green hydrogen. We have to get our a blueprint into an implementation phase so that we can start getting the build program up to a, a scale that is needed for this transition to a cleaner and a more secure energy future. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.